Okay, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening or good morning, whenever you choose to watch this. Can I just ask those people who are here, can you hear me okay? Just wave your hand or tell me or something. Uh, yes. yes I okay, all right. Hi, hello, everyone. Um, so, um, welcome to this um, accelerated uh, summer class in forensic science. Um, as we variously refer to this as forensic science, criminalistics, and also forensic biology. We do tend to um, emphasize the biological aspects throughout, um, but you'll hear about all different aspects of forensic science. And um, you'll see in a little while why we use those different terms as well. They all basically mean the same thing. So my name is David Muir. And um, I teach this class on a quite a regular basis, but usually um, during a whole semester. So I will tell you that it's uh, quite a job, quite a task to fit all the material into this accelerated class. Um, as I've told you in emails and on Canvas, um, we are dividing this class. We'll have class four times a week for 55 minutes. And um, those classes are all recorded and uploaded to YouTube, so you can watch them anytime and you can see them repeatedly if you need to do so. In addition to that, um, they will regularly, I will ask you to go to YouTube and to view videos uh, from YouTube. That is not during class time, that is outside of class time kind of homework for you. Um, I will also regularly set discussions up um, on Canvas for you to do. Um, I, it's important that you do get a copy of the textbook. Um, the current, the, the most recent one is this, which is Criminalistics by Safistein. Um, but really any of the earlier editions, anyone, I, I'd say anywhere from the 10th, 10th, 11th, 12th, editions of this book will serve you just fine. Um, there are some additional things put into the 12th and 13th, but I cover them in my lectures. I cover them in the PowerPoints. So uh, for the, all of them, the basic stuff, earlier editions, which are much cheaper if you buy them online, those are, are perfectly good. So um, I'm asking you please for each section, to make sure that you read through the entire chapter. You will find that uh, in my class, I can only touch on the various things in, in the chapter. I cannot cover every single detail in the chapter, but your tests will largely be based on what we do in class. But it's very important for you to get the whole picture. And that, that entails some work on your own part. Read this, those who read succeed. If you, read, if you develop the habit of reading, not only your textbook, but reading in general. Reading is gym. It's gym for your brain. And it makes, it sees to it that your brain is fit for intellectual endeavor. This is extremely important, especially in these days when we are besieged by electronic media. It's very important that you take time to sit every day with a book, magazine, whatever, paper with printed type on it. It forces the neurons of your brain to behave in a particular analytical way, which you then apply to your general learning and, and life experience. Uh, just one second. I just want to check that we are, yes, okay. All right, so um, it, we, in our discussion about um, forensics, and about criminalistics, you'll see the definitions in a minute. It's really quite extraordinary thing to realize um, that a lot of what we are going to discuss was first posited in fiction. The science of forensics is actually quite a recent science. Many aspects of it are really recent. And in fact, most of what we're going to talk about was developed in the 20th century. But it's the most incredible thing that a real interest in this, these kinds of investigative techniques was pr 
promulgated by a fictional character, and that was Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes, written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, one of the most popular fictional characters ever written in the English language. And um, Conan Doyle had an almost prophetic vision of how crime might be investigated. So he had his character, Sherlock Holmes, in investigating crimes or in interviewing people, whatever. He had this ability to spot very, very small clues, which we now regularly do, and we call that trace evidence. And he applied techniques which were still yet were yet to be developed, but Conan Doyle saw them in his brain as being future in the future and useful. And he let Sherlock Holmes have access to these things like testing of blood, um, almost unknown at the time in 1887. Fingerprinting, which was in its infancy in, at that time. Sherlock Holmes regularly used fingerprinting. He uh, used firearm identification from bullets and from uh, patterns of powder and everything, something that is regularly done now, but was unknown then. And many other things which were attributed to Sherlock Holmes and allowed this very uh, rounded character to be developed. And a lot of what he looked at was things which up till then at crime scenes were often just disregarded or swept away. Where in this period in the 19th century at a crime scene, they looked really at the gross aspects of the crime and they depended very, very heavily on witnesses. And uh, witnesses to identify a suspect um, or people to point out a suspect and then brutally often interrogate those suspects in order to try and establish who had committed the crime. There was no such thing as really going and looking at the car and looking at blood pattern, looking at stuff that had been left behind, any of this sort of thing. Sherlock Holmes did. He looked at cigar ash, he looked at hair, fingerprints, all of these sorts of things in fiction sparked the ideas. They sparked the ideas in people who were really involved in crime investigation. And they began actually to develop some of these techniques. It was in fiction that magnification of, by magnifying glass or by microscope was first used by Sherlock Holmes. And he or even examined blood for poisons, all of these sorts of things unknown essentially when he was being written as a fictional character. But very soon, this kind of thing sparked the interest of forensic investigators and it led them to begin developing, searching out methods which had already been developed and developing new methods. And those from that time on, from the end of the 19th century on through the 20th century, we see a continual development of tech, forensic investigatory techniques, a lot of which we're going to hear about. And so let's get some definitions uh, in, in place. First of all, what does forensic mean? As a forensic noun, a forensic is actually an argumentative exercise. It's something that you would learn if, as, as you did in the old days, you learned rhetoric. It's an argumentative exercise. And it means if effectively it's drawn from what happens in a court of law, that an argument is, is presented to the court that a certain set of circumstances occurred. And a defense attorney, for example, might put in their own forensic argument that something else occurred in order to exonerate their client. That is the origin of the word forensic. But we have now come to associate it with the application of science to law. And so forensics now we regard as being a science, 
it has many different aspects and some, as you'll hear, not all of its aspects are, are truly scientific. But it, the, the world of forensics encompasses many, many kinds of science, but they are all geared towards one end. And that is trying to sort out, trying to show the circumstances of a crime and hopefully to point out, to point towards a suspect with some degree of certainty. So there, nowadays in forensic science, we draw from many, many, many different fields um, uh, uh, may con that may contribute. I'm not gonna go through this entire list. You can read through it on your own, um, but I'll point out some of the really important ones that we will hear about um, in future, and they're, they're really these ones um, at the top here. Anthropology. Anthropology is the measurement and study, essentially, of the body itself, but especially the skeleton. Because in very frequently, when a, a body is deposited and left for any length of time, all that we're left with is the skeleton. And anthropologists can tell us a huge amount just by looking at the skeleton until age, sex, race, um, even sometimes occupation, um, all of these sorts of things, they all leave their marks on the skeleton. Odontology is the study of teeth. That is forensic dentistry, very often used to identify um, a body or because if, if other idea, means of identification have been lost. Forensic entomology, is an increasingly important field. Forensic entomology is the study of insects and their association, especially with the, with the decaying body because they provide us with a tremendous amount of, of information about time of death and circumstances of deposition of the body. Genetics and serology. Genetics is the now we, uh, one of the central features of forensic science because this is where we study DNA. This is where we study principles of heredity um, and we'll hear a lot later on in, in the course about DNA and how it is used but we, we join it together with this uh, science here it is serology and serology is the study of the blood and of the body fluids and um, that often contributes much information in other areas as well, and especially in this field here, which is toxicology. Forensic toxicology is the study of drugs their, and their presence in the body and their effects on the body. Pathology is the um, study of the body itself to determine the cause of death, etc., et and the means of death, all of this thing is established. This is, of course, the role of the pathologist is very often to perform an autopsy on a body in order to do to determine all, all of these kind of things. Um, fingerprinting. The fingerprinting is one of the, um, in fact, one of the older um, forensic sciences. Um, and uh, we'll, we're going to talk a little bit about its history in a while because it has a very interesting history in forensic science. But fingerprinting is still um, an extremely important aspect of forensic investigation. And that is because no two people, as far as we know, have identical fingerprints. There are people who have extremely similar fingerprints, identical twins, for example, as we'll hear. Um, but nobody so far has been discovered who has identical fingerprints to another person. So that is, became the very first way in which forensic scientists could actually type a person. They could say only this person could have deposited these fingerprints. Um, the study of ballistics is the study of, of guns um, and of bullets. And uh, you'll realize the tremendous number of, with the tremendous number of guns in this country, for example, this is a very, very frequent uh, 
part of a crime scene of the commission of a crime. So this is a very, very important aspect of forensic science. All the rest of these may have certainly contribute and we'll hear how they do, but I'm, I'm not going to run through them at the moment. We will hear about some of them all the way through, but realize looking at this list, how very complex the, the science of forensics actually is. Each of these, no matter what, which one you look at, each of them requires a particular expert, particular expertise. And that expertise has to be, has to be used with great ethical and with great care. Because if at any point, any of these experts fall prey to sloppy work or to unethical behavior, they may completely prejudice an entire investigation, not just their part of it, but the entire investigation. A forensic investigation depends upon the honor and the ability of every single person who participates. So, um, nowadays, it was, I must tell you that Sherlock Holmes was, was uh, long before anything but print media existed. Um, the, uh, Sherlock Holmes was by far the most popular fictional character who had ever been invented. And um, uh, in his own way, in a good way, he exerted what we could call the CSI effect. Now, CSI, you know. This is one of the most popular crime scene investigation dramas on TV. This takes its name from crime scene investigation. Um, and it capitalized on a growing interest in modern times in crime investigation. And, uh, but it has sparked a tremendous interest, amount of interest in many, many people. But unlike Sherlock Holmes, unfortunately, it depends upon a fictional portrayal of techniques which are already used. It's not, it's not positing new methods which would lead to developments in the field. It certainly has popularized the study of forensic science. There is no denying that. But it has inculcated into people's brains some very false ideas about forensics and about investigation of crime. And the, it is, of course, first of all, that the investigation usually proceeds pretty smoothly from start to finish, maybe with one or two diversions to keep your interest in between the commercial breaks. Um, the, crime, the, the crime itself is, is almost invariably solved. Um, that is problematic in itself because many, many, many crimes are never solved. Even murder is there is a very high rate of um, number of murders which are never solved, despite the presence of abundant evidence. Um, the second thing is that in the, these kind of TV programs, fictional TV programs, the crime scene always yields useful forensic information, and usually associated with that, there is useful eyewitness. Uh, testimony or whatever, which drives the investigation forward. And they almost always lead to arrest and then to conviction. Almost none of this is true in real life. And it creates this kind of a very false expectation in ordinary people. People who are subject themselves to crime expect something like the CSI to happen to them and for a resolution to be rapidly reached. It's very seldom the case. We usually deal with very imperfect evidence. We have, they you very often have to deal with extremely imperfect uh, witness recollection, even of people directly involved in the crime. Human memory is extremely fallible um, and people do not deliberately leave evidence behind. Uh, unless they're trying to set up a scene. But the evidence which we, is gathered at a scene is maybe transitory, it may be difficult to understand, um, it may be difficult to place into any sort of narrative. These are often, usually in actual fact, extremely messy scenes. 
um, which are difficult to sort out and require a number of people to examine them carefully to put this, the evidence together and arrive at a conclusion. Um, so I, I, I know that this may be a little bit um, disappointing to you to learn, but um, fewer than a half of all violent crimes against a person are solved in the United States. It's actually about 47.6%. And um, of those, half of those, is there sufficient evidence to actually result in a prosecution, let alone a conviction. So um, there's, uh, this includes murder, by the way. So um, many, many murders, many assaults, many rapes go <clears throat> un unsolved. Um, very, very few property crimes actually are, are ever prosecuted. Um, and there, I, I, I've got to move that because I can't say it's 20 something percent. So our rate of solving crimes is actually quite low. It's a disappointing statistic to, to realize. We have this idea, especially from things like law and order and, and CSI, that every crime is being solved by DNA these days. That's not true at all. Um, very good evidence like DNA um, is seldom left at a scene. We usually have to deal with imperfect evidence um, and put that together with a whole set of circumstances in order to arrive at a story for the crime and an, an indication of a suspect, if it arrives at all. So I'm just going to tell you, apart from uh, Sherlock Holmes, who is a fictional character, um, there are real characters in the history of forensic science. We uh, call this gentleman, uh, Mathieu Orphia, um, the father of forensic science. Um, he was actually just a, a general scientist. Um, he may have been a, a, a doctor, a, a medical doctor, I'm not entirely sure. Um, but he was extremely interested in poisons. And um, up until uh, Orphia began his work, um, very little was actually known about the character of poisons. There were many poisons known, um, everything from plant poisons um, to things like arsenic um, and other heavy metals, these sorts of things which were used in the commission of murders. Um, but very little was known about them. There was no way to, to actually test people to see if, that, if drugs were present. The one way that they did have to try and identify what poison had been administered was to look at the symptoms. And that is what Orphea was interested in. And he worked on animals um, and administered various toxins to animals and observed what the results were um, and cataloged them. He, he was really the, also the father of forensic toxicology, the study of drugs and poisons and their impact. It took many years though before techniques were devised which would not only identify, chemically identify the presence of poisons, but also quantify them, which was the next step after identification. The next um, person of real importance is this gentleman here, Alphonse Bertillon, who is French. And um, look at the time, look at his dates, and you'll realize where is Sherlock Holmes is in here somewhere. And I would venture to bet that Bertillon was strongly influenced by reading the stories about Sherlock Holmes, because what he did, he realized we had no way of really identifying people. Photography was coming, was becoming extremely popular and extremely common. It had moved out of being extremely expensive, was being now uh, becoming available much more widely than just a few people who could afford to do it. And um, he was also, he was very interested in using photography and as a means of identification, but there's a big problem. And that is actually when you look at a photograph, one person often can look very much like another person. It doesn't really tell you 
just because they're similar in a photograph. It doesn't tell you that those are two people are the same. And there was a great need to be able to, for law enforcement, to be able to identify a person. Realize that at this time, it was very easy to disappear. There, people could commit a crime in one city and just go to another city somewhere else and adopt another name, another profession, whatever, a whole other life and essentially disappear. And even if you pick that person, if you pick the new identity up, said, but you look, all you could do is say, you look like the person who committed a crime in another city. If by chance you happened to have somebody that could do that, you know, a witness or somebody. But there's no way to actually identify that person, say that they were not two different people. So Bertie was very interested in this problem. So what he did was he, dis he developed this system, which was called anthropometry. It simply means measuring the body, especially me measuring the proportions of the skeleton is essentially what he was doing. And he, uh, it involved taking extensive body measurements of things like the length from the elbow to the wrist for example, the length of the foot, the length of the lower leg, various other measurements, which were all put together into a kind of a formula. And for each person, there was a different combination of these figures. It was extremely laborious, and, um, but it did end up providing a fairly good way of identifying of putting identifying characteristics on a particular person. So th that's the first thing. The second thing is that Bertillon was the first person to use the mugshot, a profile and a full face photograph and a standard lighting, which allowed a permanent record to be kept of how that person looked at that particular time. And it was, this was a good, method for what it offered, which I'll explain in a second. Um, it was used for nearly 20 years, widely all over the world. Um, but here's the problem. It certainly is useful. Let's say somebody commits a crime here in New York and they are apprehended and they are photographed and all their about your measurements are logged and kept. That person then disappears. And the next appearance of that person is under a completely new name, a completely new identity and everything in San Francisco. And they commit a crime there. And now the same thing happens. They take photographs, but they look different. They do the Bertillon measurements and they have all the Bertillon measurements. If they are lucky enough, to be able to compare the San Francisco Bertillon measurements to the New York Bertillon measurements. They can say this is the same person. But here are a number of disadvantages to this method. First of all, it's extremely laborious. Second of all, you have to keep this extensive data, set of data in some form that you can actually communicate it to someone else and compare. That was a great downfall because there was no easy way, there was no computerized system where this could be logged in and things could be compared. You had to physically carry those measurements to San Francisco or whatever and somebody sit down and do the comparison. If anybody actually called for it, if anybody actually thought that this was the same person. But the real disadvantage of the Bertillon measurement is Somebody committing a crime doesn't leave anything of their better your measurements behind. If you're lucky, you may get a footprint, but you're not going to get the length of their, of their arm and be able to compare it to, and combine it in a formula with the length of their lower leg, et cetera, et cetera. A person doesn't leave anything at a crime scene which will betray their Bertillon measurements. In and so that was a downfall of the Bertillon. But for, lo for those 20 years, it was the only way of providing identifying character 
to a particular person. So it was useful for that in itself. But the Bertillon measurements, um, here are the, here is the, the actual ways of, of doing it, by the way. They have, all of these different things were measured and then they were put into a, you know, put into a formula and so that the, it could be indexed and so that it could be searched relatively easily, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the most useful thing that remained of the Bertillon system was the mugshot. And that was became part of forensic investigation for all time. So um, I, I ask you here, to, in your notes, like that you are making yourselves, please pay attention to this. Um, try and look at the system. It's actually, it's actually a, a good system for one reason. It's a truly scientific system. It is using data. It is using firm data. It's using measurement in order to provide an identification for a person. And it, in that aspect, it was pretty good at doing that. You could certainly use it for that. But it has so many disadvantages. In your notes, under, use these as headings and make for yourself some notes and discussion about the Bertillon system. What is good for and what were its disadvantages? Bertillon's system was replaced by the science of fingerprinting, of fingerprint analysis, which we'll spend some time discussing in, a, in another class. The very first case which was solved by fingerprinting was by, it was solved by this man, Fold, who, um, actually exonerated somebody. There had been a burglary, and the burglar had left uh, fingerprints behind. Um, he had put his, his fingers in dust of some sort, in flour or something, and had left clear fingerprints. And, and somebody was arrested for this robbery, um, who swore up and down that he was innocent. And um, this fold, and the detective had this idea because he'd seen at the crime scene, he saw these fingerprints. And so he, he thought, oh, he went, had the idea to go and get the suspect's fingerprints and compare them. And just by eye, not using the kind of fingerprint analysis that we do now, but just by eye, he could immediately see this was not the same person. So it actually led to the exoneration. It's ironic, but very telling that evidence, forensic evidence is often as important in clearing somebody as it is in convicting. It's something we should always bear in mind. This uh, man here, Francis Galton, he was actually a relative of uh, um, Darwin's, and, um, but uh, he was also interested in evolution and various things. But he published a textbook on fingerprints. He was just interested in the, in the evolutionary significance of fingerprints which are present not only in human beings, but in apes, their relatives, the, the apes as well. Um, but this was not really a, a book on solving crime or anything like that. It was just about fingerprints, how fingerprints are created, how they are structured, um, all the different kinds of fingerprints that they are. But this gentleman here, in South American, uh, called Vukitic, um, read, this book by Galton. And he actually looked at the way in which Galton classified fingerprints and realized that he could set up a system of identification where he could take people's fingerprints, keep them on record, and then if they saw them again at a crime scene, they could match them. Alternatively, if they had a crime scene and there were fingerprints there, they could collect those fingerprints. And if they got suspects, they could take the suspect's fingerprints and compare them. That's, that sounds easy to do, but it's not that easy to do when you realize that how many different kinds of fingerprints they are. If everybody essentially has unique fingerprints. Vukitic set up a system where you could actually index people's fingerprints so that you quickly sort through 
thousands and thousands of copies of fingerprints and try to match up a, a known set of fingerprints with, an, with something maybe collected at a crime scene, an unknown set. You, you, to do that matching up, you've got to physically get them together. In the old days, this was done by I and Vukatic's contribution was the development of this indexing system that allowed you to do that relatively quickly. And this really, um, his system is a system essentially which is still used. It's been elaborated on and developed and everything, but he was the first to develop this indexing system. And um, the, ho the whole point of that is that a fingerprint, if you have a fingerprint, it's a, you know, even a beautiful fingerprint, a clear one, which is not common at a crime scene, it's absolutely useless to you unless you can match it to somebody. That match has to be made for there to be any evidentiary value to the fingerprint. And um, this required the elaboration of Vukatic's, as thousands and millions of sets of fingerprints began to be accumulated and they had to be sorted by eye. The development of these classification systems became crucially important and they uh, set up systems where you could logically and search through huge set data sets in order to try and make um, a match. It was still, for, until the development of computers, still done by eye, still very, very laborious. And they often missed, they would often miss the, the ma match which was there. Here's a case here in the United States, which put an end to the Bertillon system once and for all. And um, this is a case of the, of the William Wests, two William Wests. One was William, the other was called Willie. And um, here they are. Um, have a look at them. They're, these are the mug shots. Just look at them. They, they absolutely look exactly like one another. And the one of them, uh, I think it was William West, had been arrested in 1905 and was sent to, found guilty and was sent to prison, um, swearing that he was innocent, swearing up and down that he was innocent of whatever the crime it was. It wasn't murder. It was theft or something like that. But he swore blind. It was not him. It had no, he had nothing to do with it. And when he was sent to prison, there in the, in the prison he was sent to was the other William West, Willie West. And when, so they said, oh, well, this is easy. We'll do your Bertillon measurements. They did the Bertillon measurements of the two of them. The Bertillon measurements were identical. They could not distinguish between the two of them. And instead, somebody looked at their fingerprints. They had fingerprints from the scene of the crime. And they were able, obviously, they were in prison. They were able to obtain their fingerprints. Their fingerprints were very similar to one another, but clearly, different. And William West, his fingerprints did not match those from the crime scene. He was in fact innocent. And the other, the Willie West, had a long rap sheet. He was, he was a felon of long standing. And this case was extremely famous because it spelt the end of the Bertillon measurement system and the advent of fingerprinting as a means of identification. There is a twist to the tale, which you might have thought of already. And that is that they act, the two William Wests were actually um, related. They were identical twins. And they had been separated. And one had gone good and one had gone bad. Um, and in fact, poor William West, had this had happened to him before. He had been arrested before for crimes which his brother had committed. They actually didn't, it appears they did not know one another. Uh, their encounter in prison was the first time they actually physically met. Um, but William West was innocent of all crimes. Willie West was a bad man. So that's the start of fingerprinting. We'll hear a lot more about fingerprinting. So the other 
development, especially at the end of the 19th century and then the beginning of the 20th century, um, was a test for human blood. Now, this had been a huge problem because at uh, violent crime scenes, uh, blood is often deposited, of course. But in the old days, um, you, they simply had to make a presumption that if a person had been wounded and there was blood present, it was that person's blood. But if more than one person shed blood, there was very little to be done. And the people would often make a claim that they had maybe they slaughtered a chicken in the kitchen or, or something like that and they had deposited blood. It was very difficult to look at a stain, especially an old stain, and definitively say that is blood. Blood has tremendous evidentiary value for all sorts of reasons that we'll hear about. The way it's deposited, the pattern it's deposited in, who it belonged to, all of this stuff can be gleaned from a good blood stain. But the first thing you have to do is prove that it is blood. And that is, that was the, the this the test here, the Castle Meyer test, named for two different people who developed it. The Castle Meyer test uses a, a chemical called phenolphthalein. Um, and phenolphthalein uh, reacts with hemoglobin. And it will, uh, in, in the presence of hemoglobin, it turns a bright red color, a reddish purple color. So this was the Castlemeyer test is the presumptive test to show the presence of blood and it is still used. But that, that it is blood is clear from the presence of hemoglobin, but all animal blood, all vertebrate blood contains hemoglobin. Um, and if blood has been deposited from an animal, for example, then it can easily be confused with human blood. It looks identical. So a test had to be developed, which could sh definitively show that something was human blood. And this is called, the test that was developed is, was uh, developed in the 1920s, 1930s. It was called the precipitin test. And it depends upon um, using uh, the immune system to produce substances which are specific against human blood. So what they did was they would in, inject human blood into rabbits the rabbit's immune system would react against the presence of the human blood and produce antibodies to, the, to, to the, the, that blood. Those antibodies can be purified from the rabbit blood. And you can then test those against a solution taken from a stain. And if the antibodies react uh, against components of the blood, then that is a definitive test that this is in fact human blood. So um, here it is. Here it is. Here, um, what they what they do is they uh, never mind about this this diagram and just use this one here. Um, so this is uh, extracted from the stain itself. It's a solution of the stain, and in that solution will be substances which are specific. They are proteins and they are specific to human beings. No other vertebrate has them. Down here, you layer this on top of a solution of antibodies, of rabbit antibodies, and it's rabbit antibodies against these human proteins. If those proteins are present here, then it actually, they react with one another and they come out of solution there and it forms a precipitate. And here's an actual test here. You see, this is just clear. The top looks similar to the bottom, just a clear straw color. But in the middle here, this is the precipitin. This is a precipitate, which is formed from a reaction of antibodies with antigens, the proteins and things in the human blood. This tells you that solution was taken from a stain which is definitively human blood. So that's fine. Now we've got a test which can prove that our stain is human blood. But whose human blood? 
that's something entirely different. Because blood is often shed at the scene of a crime, by not only by victim, but by a perpetrator as well. And not only that, blood can be sent, found, probably blood droplets can be found in most households. Because we cut ourselves the whole time and we bleed a little bit, we drop a little bit of blood, we don't even notice. But a crime scene investigator may come across a stain that looks like blood and wonder what it is doing there and test it. And what, not only do we need to know that that is human blood, we need to know who that belongs to. And that was the job of this uh, scientist, Dr. Karl Lundsteiner. And he was the first person to realize that human blood can be classed into different categories. And these categories are established by looking at proteins um, uh, which are present um, on the surface of red blood corpuscles. And these, uh, I'm sorry, I said proteins. It, they, never mind, forget I said protein. Just take it off because they're actually not really proteins. There are these mark, call them markers. Okay, we're not doing biochemistry, so we can just call these, there are markers on the surface of red blood corpuscles. And uh, the markers actually, there are really only two of them, A and B in Lundsteiner's system, A and B. Some people only have A, some people only have B, some people have both, they have A and B. And some people have no markers on their red blood corpuscles at all and they we call O. So here are, um, I'm sure you have heard about these four blood groups. The blood groups are A, AB, B, and O. Later on, another set of, of markers was found called the RH marker. Most people are RH positive, but a few people don't have the marker and they are RH negative. And those two are used together. So everybody should know their own blood group. My blood group is A positive, which is a relatively common uh, blood group. Um, the rarest blood groups of all um, are just using this system would be the AB um, system, the AB people who have both A and B marker on their red blood corpuscles. This allows us now to look at a blood stain and at least take that the blood and we can say that this blood came from somebody who belongs to this particular group. That in itself may be enough. It may be enough to include somebody in a suspect pool. It may be enough to exclude somebody from a suspect pool. And there is another useful thing about this and that is that this can be applied to other body fluids especially to semen, which is frequently deposited at the scene of sex crimes. And this, this meant that if you had sufficient of the, the stain present, it could actually be used to place people into a group. It didn't provide an individual identification, but it might well allow you to include that person in a smaller group or as importantly, exclude them from consideration. So Lundsteiner's findings were very, very important. The other um, developments in forensics um, in the 20th century um, was the use of the microscopy, as had been predicted by Sherlock Holmes, but in many different ways. Microscopy is extremely important because it allows us to see things which are too small for us to be able to discern with the naked eye. And this, 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 this um, investigative technique in particular is still used pretty much as it was developed by this man, Goddard. And he used a microscopy to link bullets with a gun. We'll find out a lot more about this later on, but a gun, acquires characteristics which are unique to it. And it imparts 
those characters to a bullet fired through its barrel. We can link a particular bullet to a particular gun in much the same way that we can link a particular fingerprint to a particular suspect by comparing them. And Goddard developed this system for doing so. He um, made this compar a comparison microscope. It allowed investigators to look at two images and bring them together. So what you could do, if you had a suspect bullet and you had a suspect gun, you could take your suspect bullet, put it under the microscope. You could take a clean new bullet and fire it through the suspect gun and then compare those two bullets to one another. And if the markings were sufficiently similar, you could make the assumption that both had been fired through the same barrel. So here is an example of Goddard's comparison microscope. A bullet, on, on, a bullet here on this side, a suspect bullet, and here a standard bullet, or maybe the other way around. I think actually this is the suspect bullet, and this is the standard bullet. What he's looking at are these lines here. There are imperfections in the barrel of the gun. And when the bullet is fired, it scars the bullet with those markings. And if they are sufficiently similar, which they look to be here, then you can say that this bullet and this bullet were both fired through the same barrel, i.e. the same gun. And that can often prove that a particular weapon was used because bullets have very frequently been recovered from crime scenes and from bodies uh, where people have been murdered by, by gunfire. Now, not all of the so-called forensic sciences are as successful as others. The most successful of the, the forensic science are those which depend upon hard scientific evidence. We will hear something late, probably tomorrow, about the scientific method. Um, but unfortunately, there are some aspects of forensic investigation um, which became extremely important, um, but did not, de but depended too much upon subjective analysis. And this is one of them. Um, this uh, gentleman, Osborne, um, produced a, a book called Questions Documents, and he was uh, responsible for persuading courts to accept documents as scientific evidence. And um, the, certainly the science of document examination is still very, very important. But this um, uh, led to all sorts of practices such as com comparing handwriting, etc., which was far too subjective. And since this its heyday in uh, right up until probably the 1970s, um, things like handwriting analysis, etc., um, were widely used but have fallen into disrepute. There are many aspects of document examination, as we'll hear, which are truly scientific. Um, but there are, unfortunately, the, the whole science of question documents became somewhat tainted um, because of errors that were made in certain cases. Um, this uh, here uh, introduces us now to the very first time, uh, sort of instance where we'd use the term criminalistics. And this is thanks to this gentleman, Hans Gross, who was German. And he wrote um, a, a work, a treatise, a magnum opus, huge book, in which he drew together all of the different sciences which might be applied to forensic investigations. And he, uh, why, he, he was very, very widely read and very, very widely experienced. And he pulled together the forensic studies of botany, anthropology, chemistry, um, geology, because he was interested in soils and things like that, all sorts of things, which he brought together and talked about them as, instead of being separate, talked about them as being a single science. 
and he referred to that to as criminalistics, the investigation of the crime, the investigation of the crime scene, applying whatever techniques you needed to the crime scene in order to tell the story of the crime and to tell the, try and point to a suspect. So criminalistics is really the practice of acquiring evidence. It's the science of evidence and its acquisition and how to deal with it. Um, we'll fi I'll finish with this for today with this gentleman. Um, and this is Edmund Locard. And uh, this is one of the most um, famous aspects of forensic science. Um, it's a dictum. It's something that you hear stated very frequently about crime scenes in general. Um, he was really one of the very first uh, forensic scientists to establish a forensics laboratory uh, where he could pull together expertise of all different kinds in order to investigate. But he's most famous uh, for the, the fact that he, he wrote this, wherever he steps, whatever he touches, whenever he leaves, even unconsciously serves as a silent witness against him, the suspect. Not only fingerprints or footprints, but hair, fibers from his clothes, the glass he breaks, the tool mark he leaves, the paint he scratches, the blood he deposits, all that he collects. All of these bear mute witness against him. And this became known as low cards exchange principle. What it is in fact saying is that everybody entering a crime scene will bring things to that crime scene. And when they leave, will take things away with them even inadvertently, even the investigators. This is, we always need to be aware of the fact that a crime scene can be radically altered by materials and evidence inadvertently brought in by investigators. But the hope is that when a, a suspect leaves a crime scene, the suspect takes with them sufficient evidence from that crime scene that we can tie the two of them together. And that is the importance of Locard's principle. Everybody entering a crime scene brings in something. Every time they leave the crime scene, they take something away with them. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop there, um, but I do want to just flick ahead for a second. Um, where am I? Um, I have a little movie that I want you to have a look at. I can't seem to find it, uh, but if you could just look through this uh, set of PowerPoints and find the link to a movie called um, In the Bag. I would like you please to have a look at that movie um, before tomorrow, okay? So it's, it's short, it's like 20 minutes. Um, and uh, you can also search it out on YouTube if you want. It's a, f I believe, a forensics files um, in the back, it's called. And there is a link. Uh, I'll search it out again and I'll send, I'll post it in on Canvas as well in the announcements. So that you can link to it there. Okay. And then I'll see you all tomorrow. If there are any questions, please feel free to ask. Tomorrow, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Is there a live Zoom tomorrow? Uh, no, no. This week, we are, this week, we are, our live Zoom will be today only. Tomorrow will be recorded. Thank you. Okay. All right then, everybody. Thanks a lot, and I'll um, uh, well, I'll see you online anyway um, uh, tomorrow. Thank you, Professor. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.